do research at the San Francisco Fed, and we research a large number of topics. Uh, but recently, I've been very interested in the foreclosure crisis, and particularly understanding the mechanisms by which we got to the foreclosure crisis. Um, and not so much, I think a lot of people are paying attention to that on sort of a macroeconomic level and looking at things like securitization. Just for my notes, can we get copies of this later so I don't have to write down anything you're saying? You bet. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, and Paul actually has the paper. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> uh, oh, we posted on the Google. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the slides can, the paper can't be posted. So, but, um, yeah, so less so from a macroeconomic perspective, but more for how it's really affecting families uh, and particularly lower income families and communities of color. Um, and I'm very interested in the 12th the nine states of the Western of the Federal Reserve's Western 12th District, uh, which includes California, Arizona, and Nevada, <coughs> of course, the hardest hit by the foreclosure crisis. So what I'm going to present today is some new research that really looks at how this foreclosure crisis is, is affecting uh, different families in California, and I'm focusing on the Central Valley, um, but also to look at the mechanisms by which it happens, so that after my presentation, you can all talk about how to solve that going forward. So this is a intelligent audience that has been working on the ground for a long time. I don't think I need to tell you all that the Central Valley has been extremely hard hit by the foreclosure crisis. Um, in fact, so if you look at those red and orange areas, that's where everywhere sort of above 10% of uh, outstanding loans are in foreclosure or have been foreclosed upon. Uh, the national average right now is about 2%. Um, so you can see that the Central Valley is really hard hit that really it is a regional issue if you sort of look you know, pretty much red and orange all the way down the Central Valley. Um, the bigger question is, who's been foreclosed upon? And this is actually a very difficult question to answer. Because although we have plenty of data on foreclosures through different types of data sets, we don't have any information on the borrowers that match or match to data on foreclosures. So although we have a lot of good, strong anecdotal evidence about who's been we don't actually have any hard numbers. Um, uh, so one problem is that we don't have one data source that links both loan origination data, so the borrower and the terms of the loan, with information about foreclosure and this chart of loan performance, the other side of the loan. Okay. The other thing that's really hard to figure out is um, this interdependence between individuals, the loan products they get, and the loan outcome. So if you imagine a very risky borrower who takes out a loan that they know in advance they can't pay off, but they're banking on flipping the loan, we're more likely to see a foreclosure on, this, on that person's side once the market goes under, right? But we don't know, so we don't know whether or not that foreclosure is driven by that risky behavior or if it was something done by the market um, that caused that. And I'm going to talk about that in more in a little bit. Uh, in a little bit. Um, and what we can control for some of these factors, such as FICO score, there's likely the unobservables that we can't control for. And particularly either sort of risky behavior or speculative behavior. And the other thing that we can't control for is wealth. So we don't have a picture of people's assets. So we don't know how many assets they have, so we can't sort of control how they can use those assets if they face a foreclosure. Um, so what I'm going to present today is some research that uniquely matches data in California and it matches data on foreclosures with data on borrowers. So for the first time, we actually get a picture of who is in foreclosure. And using some uh, two-step modeling techniques, we can actually control for these unobservables. So we can see whether or not uh, the higher likelihood of foreclosure among certain population groups is due to them being riskier, or if it's due to some other factor within the mortgage market. Uh, so two-step modeling process. Okay, so <laughs> the first thing that we find in doing this two-step modeling process, and I'm going to focus here on communities of color, and the reason I'm focusing on communities of color instead of low-income communities in California and moderate income, which is usually the focus of my research, is that the foreclosure crisis is actually not very much of a low-mod crisis in California, and that was because of the very high house prices that existed in California. Most people who sort of made under the definition of low or moderate income weren't buying homes in California, or they were buying homes through affordable home ownership programs, which were, uh, which have not been plagued by the same level of foreclosures as in the private market. This is very much a middle income story in California. However, it's also 
those for. And what we find is that even after we control for every possible observable characteristic, minorities are still much more likely to get a subprime loan and a subprime loan with risky features, such as prepayment penalties, adjustable rate mortgages, interest only, um, balloon payments, all those factors that we know are sort of risk factors for a loan product are disproportionately present in the minority community. I just want to show you this one slide, and all I want you to focus on actually is this last category over here. So this is borrowers who between 2004 and 2006 bought a purchased home um, and had a FICO score of over 780. Now that's a good FICO score. I don't have a 780 FICO score, right? Like that's a strong FICO score. When we look at that, blacks and Hispanics, and this data is just for California, blacks and Hispanics, 10% of them received a subprime high cost loan, compared to about 2% for whites. And we see that through every single FICO category, right? So this differential lending and differential product outcome is not due to the riskiness of the borrowers, inherent riskiness of the borrowers. Next slide. What we find is much more important in determining what kind of loan they got was the origination channel for that loan. And the first thing we find is that whether or not a borrower went through a mortgage broker is incredibly important in determining the product choice that they showed up with. And for blacks that went to a mortgage broker, they were 10% more likely to get a subprime product than blacks that did not go to a mortgage broker. For Hispanics, it was right about 7%. Now this compares to about, oh, thank you, about two to three percent for whites and Asians. So clearly there was a point in that broker channel that influenced what kind of product people got, even after controlling for every other individual characteristic of that borrower. So this, this is a model that is already has everything else in there. It has their income in there, it has their loan to value in there, it has whether or not they have documentation in there, it has their own <coughs> product in there, it has every feature about that loan transaction. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. The second thing we find is that if a minority borrower goes to a bank that has a CRA obligation, that's a Community Reinvestment Act obligation, um, and the bank is, they, they get that loan within that bank's assessment area, they're much less likely to get a high cost loan. A huge amount less likely. So if I walk through the doors of a CRA regulated institution, and I'm a black or Hispanic, I'm about 14% less likely to get a higher price loan. Um, and that's, the effect is stronger for minorities than it is for whites and Asians. I'm sorry, for blacks and Hispanics and for whites and Asians. Um, if I bought a home in an area that's underserved by financial services, 